Welcome all to the roundtable organized by the EC2U uh, Alliance. We are here in Salamanca, in Spain. Uh, I'm Ludovic Tilly, the uh, coordinator of the EC2U Alliance. Uh, and this week, uh, we are um, running the so-called EC2U Week. For the first time, we all meet face-to-face uh, -face or mask-to-mask, -mask, should I say. Uh, but this is so good to be all here on site uh, to, to really uh, see that the, the colleagues uh, with whom we have worked already for one year are real. We can touch each other within, of course, uh, all the physical distancing, but this is absolutely wonderful uh, to see uh, the community uh, around. Uh, this is actually an hybrid uh, event, so we have also people uh, online. Uh, today, for this roundtable, uh, we have our speakers uh, online, and I will introduce them in a, in a minute. But we also are uh, uh, live on YouTube, and uh, you uh, can find uh, the link on the uh, web page uh, organized by the University of Salamanca, the foundation, Fondation Lusal. Uh, and actually on the YouTube page, you will have a chat where uh, later on you can post your questions to our uh, speakers. So uh, again, uh, in the concept of the EC2U forum, we uh, propose every six months series of events. Uh, so far, they were all online, unfortunately, and again, this time, this is the first hybrid uh, mode that we are running. Uh, and we organize events where we uh, promote the results of our uh, alliance. Uh, it can be uh, the new programs, the new training programs, can be also the activities around the knowledge square uh, that uh, are mixing uh, education, research, and innovation, and of course, service to society. And we also organize each time a roundtable dedicated to higher education policies, and in particular, in the context of the uh, European Universities Initiative. Uh, in February, earlier this year, the first roundtable was on the topic of the future European degree. Uh, in May this year, for the second forum, we organized a roundtable on the very important topic uh, that are micro-credentials. And today, the third roundtable is uh, on a topic that is also, should I say, very hot. Uh, and it is about how can we assess the impact of the alliances of European universities. Uh, maybe a little bit of context on why we choose that topic. Uh, the alliances, the 41 alliances uh, that have been selected in two rounds in 2019 and uh, 2020, uh, so the 41 alliances will soon uh, have to apply for another round of funding. And it is indeed very important to see how we can properly and in an adequate manner see what is the already existing impact uh, that they have done within their universities, but also impact on the uh, outside world, should I say. And of course, it is a very difficult exercise. And the, the whole objective of this roundtable today is to share views, to share experiences, because we are already trying to assess the impact of our alliances. So the idea is really to, in a collegial manner, to try to reflect all together uh, on how we can indeed uh, assess the impact of our alliances. But beyond the sole, um, let's say, uh, direct application of this discussion to the uh, application for the next funding phase, uh, it is anyway a very important topic because should that be alliance or should that be a university, this exercise of trying to see what is the deep impact on all uh, of all our missions as uh, universities on the society is anyway a difficult exercise. Uh, it can be qualitative, it can be quantitative, and we need to search for the most appropriate uh, indicators. So to, to run this uh, discussion today, I'm actually absolutely delighted to welcome uh, uh, my colleagues uh, from different uh, profiles. Uh, this morning we will start with first a video message from the French Minister uh, for Higher Education and Research, uh, Madame Vidal, Frédéric Vidal, who uh, unfortunately was not able to join us online, but she recorded a, a very inspiring uh, video message that will 
will be shared with you, and this will be actually the very good start for uh, this collegial discussion uh, today. Then we will have, let's say, a first session where we can see views, should I say, from the ground. Uh, we will have uh, two alliances uh, who will give uh, their views, and we will start first with Emily Palmer, who is with us already online. Actually, all the speakers are already here. So, Emily Palmer, you are the Secretary General uh, of the, uh, the Alliance Una Europa. Thank you so much for being here. We will then continue with uh, Olga Vessels. Uh, Olga, you are the head of the Brussels office from ECIU Alliance. We will then see, uh, let's say, maybe a bit broader view although it may seem a bit different, uh, uh, strange to, to, to say it like that, but let's see the network uh, view, uh, and this will be first with Emmanuel Gardan, who is the director of the Coimbra Group in Brussels. We will uh, then continue with Annalena Claes Kulik, who is uh, the policy coordinator on this topic of the alliances in particular uh, at EUA, uh, European uh, Universities Association. Then we will have a brief discussion and we will move to the next level where we will have the views from the Commission and uh, we will first, uh, we will have actually a duo. Uh, the two colleagues from the Commission have agreed to present uh, in a dual manner uh, the, the Commission's views and we will have, and thanks uh, to both of you, we will have Tine Delva. Tine, you are the Deputy Head of Unit for Higher Education at the Director General on uh, higher education, cultural use, and sports at the Commission. And we also have Stein Delore. Stein, you are a policy officer at the unit uh, Academic Research and Innovation uh, at the uh, Director General on Research and Innovation, also at the Commission. And after that, we will have some time to debate. And once again, I would like to mention that the uh, colleagues, the public connected to the YouTube channel, they will have the possibility to post questions. Uh, uh, I have an eye on them and uh, I will have the possibility to raise these questions, but we will have also here in the room probably some uh, questions to, to all our speakers. So without further ado, I will now uh, show, uh, the, I will run the video from the uh, French Minister for Higher Education and Research, uh, Madame Frédéric Vidal. Uh, so I will share the Zoom screen. Hopefully I will succeed uh, in doing so. Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, je suis ravie de dire quelques mots au cours de cette session consacrée aux alliances européennes et tout particulièrement à la mesure de leurs effets sur nos écosystèmes. L'initiative des universités européennes, à laquelle la France est particulièrement attachée, a été portée par le président de la République, Emmanuel Macron. Elle représente plus qu'une promesse, un tournant majeur pour l'avenir de l'espace européen, de l'enseignement supérieur, de la recherche et de l'innovation. Les changements et l'innovation que cette dynamique apporte sont cruciaux pour former les futures générations d'Européens et accroître significativement l'attrait de recherche, entreprise, région. L'enthousiasme pour cette initiative reste intact parmi les acteurs de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche et de l'innovation et son impact est croissant. La pandémie de Covid a agi comme un catalyseur, encourageant les institutions à renforcer encore leurs liens à accélérer encore leur coopération. La période à venir avec le nouveau budget de l'Union européenne et les plans de relance nationaux contribuera à consolider ces universités européennes qui, avec les infrastructures de recherche européennes, constituent la preuve la plus tangible de notre espace européen d'enseignement supérieur, de recherche et d'innovation. Plus de 20 pays, dont la France, ont choisi d'apporter un soutien financier à leurs établissements en complément d'Erasmus+, et du programme cadre pour la recherche et l'innovation. Dans le cas français, nous apportons 100 millions d'euros sur 10 ans. Au cours du forum d'aujourd'hui, vous avez choisi de vous concentrer sur l'impact des alliances et sur la manière de le mesurer. C'est un sujet crucial afin de tester ce qui a été réalisé jusqu'à présent, d'identifier ce qui fonctionne et ce qui ne fonctionne pas, pour prendre des décisions sur l'avenir de ces initiatives et de chacune des alliances. Une évaluation de chaque projet pilote devrait être menée au regard de la vision pour 2025, définie initialement dans l'appel à proposition, 
et sur l'ensemble des critères spécifiques à chaque alliance et à son modèle. Il s'agirait par exemple de l'excellence scientifique et de la qualité des programmes de formation, de stratégies communes pour l'enseignement supérieur, la recherche et l'innovation, d'une contribution à la résilience et à la souveraineté européenne, ainsi qu'au développement des territoires, d'une masse critique et d'une intégration poussée, notamment en termes de gouvernance, de traitement des données, de graduation. La détermination des critères précis devra faire l'objet d'une concertation étroite entre les alliances, les États membres et la Commission européenne. En effet, l'un des enjeux sera de savoir ce que l'on fera une fois l'évaluation réalisée. Et ceci m'amène à la question de l'avenir de l'initiative et des alliances. Notre vision de l'avenir de l'initiative est aussi simple que cela. Donner aux alliances les moyens d'approfondir leur collaboration, les laisser nous montrer que le modèle fonctionne et contribuer à la transformation de l'enseignement supérieur en Europe. Si cela signifie ajouter de nouveaux partenaires, très bien si cela signifie consolider les écosystèmes locaux, diffuser les bonnes pratiques et les ressources, c'est aussi très bien. Cette question de l'avenir des universités européennes sera au cœur de nos ambitions pour la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne au premier semestre 2022 avec trois mots-clés. Relance, puissance, appartenance. Nous envisageons les priorités suivantes. Approfondir la mise en œuvre du carré de la connaissance alliant enseignement supérieur, recherche, innovation et service à la société. L'enjeu sera de travailler sur plusieurs objets concrets, illustrant les synergies entre ces composantes, avec notamment la stratégie européenne pour les universités, l'implication des citoyens dans les missions et une initiative européenne sur les écosystèmes d'innovation. Nous préparerons également les prochaines étapes du déploiement complet des universités européennes, afin d'approfondir le sentiment d'appartenance au projet européen. Nous contribuerons à fournir un cadre pour le déploiement de ces nouveaux acteurs dans le paysage de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche et de l'innovation en Europe. Nous nous concentrerons en particulier sur le volet recherche et innovation des alliances. Nous travaillerons également à rendre possible des diplômes européens, à tester des solutions permettant le recrutement conjoint de chercheurs ou d'enseignants-chercheurs, ou la création de structures communes, telles que des laboratoires ou des écoles universitaires de recherche. Cela ouvrira la voie à un éventuel statut, ainsi qu'à un instrument de financement alignant les sources européennes et nationales. Enfin, et ce n'est pas le moins important, nous poursuivrons le travail sur la nouvelle stratégie internationale pour la coopération dans l'enseignement supérieur, la recherche et l'innovation. Notre objectif est de profiter de la dynamique créée par les conclusions adoptées par le Conseil à la fin du mois de septembre pour lancer un nouveau dialogue multilatéral de coopération. Un grand nombre d'événements de haut niveau auront lieu en France afin d'illustrer ces priorités. L'un d'entre eux est le Forum des universités pour l'avenir de l'Europe qui se tiendra à Paris le 26 janvier 2022. Je vous invite d'ores et déjà à retenir cette date. Ce forum constituera une étape importante dans la construction d'une ambition partagée entre les parties prenantes, les États membres et l'Union européenne sur l'avenir de l'enseignement supérieur et en particulier l'initiative des universités européennes. Merci à tous et très bon travail. Well, I would like to uh, warmly thank uh, Minister Vidal for this uh, introductory uh, video message that I believe uh, perfectly sets the scene. So without further ado, I think it is uh, actually very natural now that we hear what the first ones benefiting from this initiative, the alliances, have to say about how they see uh, the assessment of the impact should be done. So it is my real pleasure once again to welcome you, Emily, Emile Palmer, you are the Secretary General from UNA Europa, uh, and you will give us your views, and for that I will also uh, share uh, your slides. Uh, I try to do that, so do not hesitate to already say a few words while I'm trying to uh, share your, your, your slides. Thank you, Ludovic, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and uh, a, a great speech uh, from, the, from the French minister. I think 
many of the points uh, raised are extremely relevant for what we're going to discuss today. And we're really looking forward to working very closely with the French presidency on all these priorities. So here are my slides, you can go straight to um, the next one. Um, I'm going to be the first speaker about how our view on um, and experience on how to um, measure impact or assess impact of the European universities and the initiative as a whole. If you go to the next slide, just to explain briefly our alliance, um, we're an alliance of um, eight uh, very large uh, research intensive universities. You can see them here on the screen. Um, uh, we have actually a student body of over um, 400,000 students. So I I think we account for about 12% of the 41 um, alliances, which makes it extremely challenging um, to collaborate. Um, but we really have at heart, if we can manage to do things um, together, our formats will really be relevant for the European higher education area as a whole. You can go to the next slide, um, please. So I'm going to dive right into the topic of the discussion rather than presenting more on Una Europa, but I will speak about our specific experiences a bit later. Um, when it comes to the impact of European universities, what's really important is to take a holistic approach. So not to look at it from the perspective of one mission of the university or from one European program and, or, and, and what their kind of criteria are, but really to take um, uh, all three missions, and of course, the overall mission of, Euro of universities, which is to serve society. What's really important here, because we're talking about European university alliances and not about single universities, is to focus on the European added value. Um, it's really important that these universities are focusing on enhancing quality going beyond what single institutions can do, joining forces uh, to do that, um, and also promoting European values, of course, is a very important matter. One point that I want to put forward, of course, from Una Europa, we have our views, uh, but it's extremely important um, uh, to say that every alliance is different, all of our 41 alliances, and there is a strength in our different models. Um, and it's really important that any uh, impact assessment takes into account the diversity um, of these different models, um, whilst of course having um, some common aims in place. And I will explain a little bit more about how that can be done. If you can go to the next slide, please. What we think is extremely important in any um, impact assessment of these European universities is taking an appreciative approach. So this means taking the mission, the starting point and the activities of the alliance in question, and then talking through how that develops. We had very positive experience with a framework evaluation that was developed, pilot, uh, through the EUNIQUE project. And I'm going to speak about that a little bit later. We think what's really important as well is to measure the European added value. So to what extent any alliance um, can not only do things together as the universities, but have the opportunity to impact the higher education area as a whole. So in the formats that are being worked upon, uh, seeing how they can be scaled up with different partners uh, within Europe and even beyond. Um, of course, alliances roles uh, in, in trying to uh, break down barriers uh, to transnational collaboration should also uh, be assessed and awarded. I was really happy with the message that was just given uh, by the French minister, because we really see these European universities initiative uh, through Una Europa as a key way to drive the competitiveness of Europe's higher education sector on the global scale. And um, so, so always having an international approach is important. Um, and I think that uh, these alliances can be extremely attractive for Europe's um, priority partnerships as well. For instance, uh, with the African continent, which we know is a priority today. If you go to the next slide, please. 
Thank you. I'm going to talk specifically now about our experience with, um, on the e Unique project because Olga, who will come directly with me, is going to talk about other ways um, of potentially measuring assessment. And Una Europa also fed into that, that thought process. But we were an alliance that was piloted um, with e Unique, so I'm going to focus on that now. This was actually a project funded by Erasmus um, that ran for a couple of years. I think it's just finalizing now because it was um, extended due to the COVID um, period. Um, but the, the, the aim of the project was really to try to develop a European approach for the comprehensive quality assurance assessment of these alliances. It was a very strong consortium uh, led by um, the, friend, the Flemish uh, ministry, uh, bringing together different quality assurance agencies from different countries, uh, ministries, and big stakeholder organizations, for instance, like EUA, uh, and Elena will be speaking later, but the European Student Union and um, um, the European Network for Quality Assurance as well. It was developed in the um, framework of the peer support group on quality assurance of the Bologna coordination and implementation group. So very much integrated into how our member states are, are, and, and broader countries under Bologna are working together on quality assurance. Um, and yeah, it was a pilot project, so it was to develop um, and test an approach. And this approach was tested on four alliances. Um, of which Una Europa was one of them. Next slide, please. Um, it took a very holistic approach um, and had uh, qualitative indicators, which is really important um, uh, to say. We can't just be focusing on quantitative indicators. The qualitative ones are really going to be um, the most important in evaluating um, how these alliances make an impact. Um, and very much from an appreciative approach. So it took the mission statement and the activities and the plans of the alliance in question and started from there. It analyzed um, the strategy and policies, the vision, how to involve different stakeholders, how to work on different challenges, and then analyzed, okay, how is this vision and policy actually implemented? What are the concrete objectives? How are resources allocated? What are the management and governance structures in place to manage that? The third um, evaluation um, uh, indicator was looking at evaluating so when activities uh, are, and pilots are carried out. How does the alliance measure that progress? Um, how does it, um, it ensure that it's um, successful and how then the final um, indicator look towards improving it. So some things went well, how do we adapt that to the future? Some things didn't work so well, how can we change that to be more successful in the future? So these were the four qualitative indicators. It was not an easy um, uh, evaluation to go through because uh, it was right at the very beginning as pilots. Um, and there was not much known about European universities. And so the evaluators had to come to terms with what is the European universities initiative? How are these four alliances different? And then how can we work through to evaluate? But I have to say it was uh, very, very positive in the end. And we got some very good feedback from the evaluators, which we now as Una Europa are taking forward um, into our next stage um, for improvement. And by the way, all of these um, uh, reports are, are very transparent. You can find them all on the eUnique website, so you can find out more about what they found about the alliances and what they recommended towards the future. Um, next slide, please. I think so. We really thought that the eUnique framework was good. It was a pilot and it does need to be improved. But we think that it could be a way forward to evaluate um, uh, alliances in the future because it's a step higher than the funding programs that are currently in place to fund European university alliances. So they're more holistic in approach. They take this appreciative approach with the mission um, of the university in question as a starting point. Where there should certainly be improvement in the unique, uh, if the framework is to go forward um, in the future, is that it was strongly focused around um, the education dimension 
um, and quality assurance around that. But of course, we know, as said by the French minister that the research and innovation dimension of our European universities is just as important um, and so how to evaluate those uh, activities definitely needs to be uh, better integrated into the unique framework um, and also the evaluators um, uh, will need to have expertise in that area as well. As mentioned uh, by uh, the French president, uh, sorry, the French minister, um, the global competitiveness of these alliances is key. And so we believe that alliances should also be measured uh, in terms of their ability to reach out globally and have that international impact. Um, and given that we have the green and digital dimensions as absolutely key of EU priorities for European values, uh, we think that these elements um, should also be taken into account in, in, in any kind of assessment in the future. Final message then from my side is that we think um, that this unique uh, framework provided a very good starting point and could be developed. Uh, where it's really strong, I think, is that it goes above um, the EU programmes Erasmus and Horizon and takes a holistic approach. And that's what we need in the future to look in a holistic way, to look at the long term perspective of European universities and beyond project to project um, and, and, and individual funding uh, schemes that alliances may use for certain activities. We need something much broader. So I, uh, I leave it with that and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what my colleagues also say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily, for this uh, very interesting presentation. I'm sure the, it will raise a lot of uh, debate a bit further uh, during the, this round table. So uh, now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome on the stage, I mean on the screen, uh, the other representative from uh, a sister alliance, uh, Olga Vessels. You are, as I said earlier, the head of the Brussels office at ECIU. So Olga, I will now share your screen, but feel free to start speaking uh, while I'm struggling with the technique. Thank you, Ludovic. I think it's going very uh, smooth so far. Um, and thank you also for organizing uh, this timely session on a very important topic, because we are in the run-up toward the full rollout of the initiative. Um, and we also have political backing from the highest level in Europe. Uh, this was also shown again by the speech of Minister Vidal. Um, so this brings responsibility to alliances, of course, to not be a black box. I had to laugh when Emily spoke about the unique evaluators that had no clear idea what alliances are about, and we certainly have to avoid this. So let's discuss the impact of alliances. Um, um, and I'd like to highlight three key messages from Vidal that, that I support very, very much. And I'd like to start with this and then in my presentation I will build upon this. Uh, first one is her message, take the alliance ambitions into account. And this is also underlined again by Emily that this diversity amongst alliances is so key and crucial in this pilot and we have to um, respect the diversity when measuring um, their impact. Uh, Vidal also spoke about the importance of synergies and her great focus also on the research leg of European universities. And of course, it's an Erasmus Plus initiative, but you cannot be serious about building a European university without strong research support. So I was really happy to hear this. And then finally, um, what made me happy was her high ambitions on the rollout of the initiative. Uh, as said, we have political momentum now. Let's make use of this. Bologna started 30 years ago, actually in the year I was born. Uh, so that's a long time ago. Uh, and we have momentum again to um, uh, uh, work at the European level close together in the field of education, but also, of course, in the field of research. I think this is a very nice foundation for the presentation that I will give now. Um, Ludovic, if you will go to the next slide, thank you very much. So, uh, walk the talk. I said we cannot be a black box. Um, so, here is a slide with some examples of the impact of European University alliances. Um, uh, because alliances are 
ambitious. They want to use this unique momentum to innovate Europe's education and research and innovation areas. Um, no pandemic, no budget issues, uh, uh, no home working can stop us alliances from deliver on the ambitions we uh, brought forward uh, some years ago. Um, and some examples of the impact we are working towards are on this slide. For example, we are in the process of developing innovative European degrees and actually the first certificates to our students, European Alliance certificates, are already handed out and students all over Europe have now on their LinkedIn profile uh, their uh, experience in, in being part of the European University Alliance. Uh, we are realizing joint research institutes we are launching European virtual campuses where students can meet in virtual reality. Uh, it's like we are talking about 2030 when I speak about this, but it's actually happening now. So this shows that the European Universities Initiative brings great momentum. The political backing is of crucial importance for the high ambitions of the alliances of the 280 presidents and rectors and staff, academics that are working now. Um, towards realizing European universities. There is much more examples here on my slide, but I will not read it out loud uh, to you. I believe the, sh the slides will be shared and you can read it here um, on the slideshow. Um, Ludovic, could you please move on? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so when we start from the different types of impact and achievements of the European University Alliances, you can already conclude that there will be an impact at different levels. Um, there will be an impact in the higher education system at the European level, for example, working towards these European degrees, the recognition of alliances um, that will be much more smooth. We will, are building the trust in each other's higher education systems for quality assurance procedures. Um, so there is also a national impact um, here and of course there's also a local impact and this is also interesting emily was focusing so much on the international outreach i would like to make here the point of the importance of regional impact um, alliances are connecting regional ecosystems with each other so there's also absolutely an advantage for the regional the local ecosystem mm -hmm. then there is also of course we are working building a european university an impact at alliance level um, and on the single institutions level because this alliance will be at least in the case of ECIU University on top of the single institutions we are not uh, mimicking what is happening at the national level we are really thinking about what is needed what's the European added value at the European level and this will be in addition to all our member institutions and then, and I think actually this is the most important level of impact, the impact on the wider society. We are not building European universities for ourselves, for only our students, staff, but we are actually doing it for the wider society and to be of added value there. And I think a key example here is the great focus of many alliances on challenge based and problem based way of working to ask society, what can we actually do for you? What do you need? Can we reskill your workforce? Do you have any challenges you need newest knowledge uh, or our creative students to take a look at um, and there achieve societal impact? And ECIU University is, I think, even taking a step further because we are uh, changing the way of delivering education from degree-based to challenge-based. So for us, degrees are not the most important. It's about solving societal challenges. Can you go to the next slide, please, Ludovic? Thank you very much. I think actually this is the key slide I present today um, because the storyline brings me to some conclusions. And the first recommendation for measuring the impact of alliances, and this is also what Vidal said and also what Emily said, so I'm not sure if this will bring uh, heated discussions later today, but we need this holistic approach. We cannot just measure the impact on education or on research or on outreach to society. Uh, we need to cover all these different aspects. Next, we need a long-term vision 
we cannot use our students as a test case here. You cannot build a university alliance with a funding horizon of three years. And also the impact will not be there. The impact that will be there today will be a different impact than that will be there in 10 years from now. So we really need a long-term vision when measuring impact. Next, it's also not a surprise maybe, but it is a crucial one. We need to support the diversity of impact, the diversity of the alliances need to be respected here. Uh, and what is then very logical is to bring a very central role to the mission statements, because this is what all alliances have in common, a mission statement that is very personal to them and it has their own ambitions working towards European cooperation. And this has to be at the heart of when measuring the impact. Uh, finally, we need to fully reward societal impact. And I'd like to, my most important message today is maybe this one. We need to look outside in instead of inside out. Alliances are not incremental, but they are very innovative. And they are building very innovative uh, things at the European level. So we need to look at what are the societal needs? What do we need from these alliances? We need to look outside of this box of frameworks that we already know um, to, to identify what is the impact that we need and our alliances delivering on this. So we dare to be innovative as alliances, but do we also dare to be innovative when measuring the impact? Um, this all sounds a little bit abstract, maybe. That's why um, ECIU University, together with other alliances, also UNA Europa, was part of this exercise. We, we work closely together. We even have a joint forum, the Forum on European Universities, where all 41 alliances uh, work together on key strategic topics like measuring the impact of um, uh, uh, the European University Alliances. And in this exercise, we looked at existing instruments. Can we learn from them? And I'd like to highlight um, some of these um, uh, instruments. For example, yeah, EUNIQUE, that was already presented uh, by Emily, but what I'd like to highlight from the EUNIQUE framework, what I like a lot is that they took the mission state statement as a starting point for their evaluation. So I think this is what we can uh, learn from the EUNIQUE um, practice. Then there is also the, the S3 instrument. And what I like from the S3 instrument is that they have this life cycle approach and this is interesting in this programmatic framework idea. Uh, it could guide us to this uh, long-term uh, vision. And in this life cycle approach, they start with the concept, then they look at the design, the preparatory implementation and the operation phase. And I think we could maybe uh, steal some of their approaches and strategy ideas uh, when evaluating European University Alliances. Next is the EU multi-rank framework. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Ludovic, <laughs> please, uh, to the previous slide still. The EU multi-rank framework, uh, what I think is really interesting about the EU multi-rank framework is this framework with fixed and optional indicators. Uh, uh, so that really um, serves the diversity of uh, the alliances. Uh, the interreg framework um, is supportive of specific goals and operations and this is i think also very very interesting how to support this in a, a, an evaluation framework and then finally of course we have to look what was there in the european university call and there need to be synergies with the ambitions we ask when at the application phase and at the evaluation phase and therefore this um, round table is so timely because the new call for the for the follow-up and also for new alliances will, be, will open very soon. And this will be key when also discussing the impact and the evaluation of the alliances, because of course there needs to be very strong links. Um, then Ludovic, please, the next slide. Um, some final words about the great collaboration and diversity amongst the alliances. So we are all together in four EU, the Forum of European Universities. 
Um, um, so we have the 24 alliances that started in 2019, and on the next slide you will see the 41 alliances that started last year, and all alliances are um, here to discuss with stakeholders, policymakers, politicians about the next steps for the European University um, initiative. So um, do not hesitate to make use of this um, uh, structure. We would be happy to discuss with you uh, topics like this, but also other strategic uh, topics. So we are organized um, and ready to work together with you to make a success out of the European University's initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga, for this, uh, again, very interesting uh, set of views that we will further discuss uh, later today. Uh, I propose now that we move on to the views for, uh, from uh, larger uh, networks, and uh, the next speaker uh, is Emmanuel Gardin, uh, who is the director of the Quimba Group of Universities based in Brussels. So, Emmanuel, uh, the floor, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Ludovic, and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's been very interesting, uh, extremely interesting so far already. I would like uh, to start um, <clears throat> briefly by uh, recording that we've been involved since the very beginning uh, of the, the first discussions on the European Universities Initiative. And this all relates to the topic of today's meeting because we had anticipated already back in 2017, that uh, this initiative would have a very high and unprecedented impact on our members and on our sector as a whole. Uh, from the Coimbra Group, we've um, been both supporting our members in engaging into the initiative and um, at the same time strengthening the exchange of best practice and um, active collaboration between our members on um, the development of the initiative, but also uh, striving to spread the innovations and the benefits um, from the initiative to our members, which are not involved in an alliance. <clears throat> Ludovic, do you, want, do you have my presentation? Or do you want me to, to share the screen, maybe? Uh, actually, uh, this is what I told you earlier, Emmanuel. I did not receive your presentation. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, I don't have any possibility to share, no? Uh, probably no. you. You should. No worries. If I can't. <clears throat> no, it's been disactivated, but no worries. So, um, from the to. Um, to give you some figures uh, about uh, how we are involved into. <clears throat> the initiative, we are, we are a network of 41 members and we, are, we have currently 32 of our members which are involved in an alliance. And as a network, we are also involved as associated partner in four alliances, including EC2U. I wanted uh, to share with you some, some food for thought for this morning. So we are talking about how to assess the impact of European universities I think we should first um, think about the what. What, uh, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the European Universities Initiative as such? And we know that uh, there are very clear objectives for, for the initiative, um, promoting common EU values and strengthening European identity on one side, and reaching uh, substantial leaps in quality, performance, attractiveness, and international competitiveness of European universities. What about um, uh, the impact of each European university alliance? And we know that uh, both are connected. And within each European university alliance, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the impact of the alliance per se? Are we talking about the, the impact of the Erasmus Plus project? Because we know uh, that we are now in a time frame where each um, of the uh, first uh, selected uh, alliances will have to report on the impact of uh, their first Erasmus Plus uh, funding. Are we talking about the impact of the Horizon uh, 2020 Horizon Europe uh, component of the alliance? So uh, there's probably also the, uh, the, the different uh, angles through which to, to discuss uh, the impact assessment of the European universities. 
Then I think um, <coughs> there should also be some reflection about the purpose. Um, the impact uh, assessment is a dynamic process which relates to the evaluation when it comes to, um, to, to uh, reporting on uh, the achievements. There are also um, some purposes related to the management, uh, as you uh, well know, uh, in each of your alliance, uh, because um, the impact assessment is also a management tool to look forward and, and adapt for the next steps. And the third purpose that we can uh, also see is a purpose for inducing changes, and uh, it, re it relates also to our common and collective uh, claims for a transition from uh, program funding to um, long-term and structural funding to the alliances. And with, uh, uh, it, it's also on the basis of the results of the impact assessment on the different alliances and on the uh, initiative itself that we will successfully uh, get um, uh, and convince policymakers to make this transition. The impact assessment um, should include the perspectives from all stakeholders affected by the alliances, and this includes the university as an institution, this includes the academic community, the rest of the staff at the university. This also um, includes the students and their families and how the emergence of these new alliances uh, affects their choices when selecting uh, their educational path. Um, as has already been um, said uh, by the earlier presenters, it's also including the, the society perspective on, on the uh, impact assessment, the, em the employer's perspective, how do the employers look at this new um, decrease and this new uh, training path when selecting um, the future workforce. There is the perspective from the international partners, the perspective from the legislature um, about um, the changes uh, pushed by these uh, new alliances, the perspective from the funders, the perspective from the policymakers, and uh, to what concerns more precisely uh, our association, the perspective from the sector. And this is uh, with this perspective that I will talk. And um, this has also uh, been um, presented by Olga right now. Uh, the impact assessment should um, <coughs> address the different uh, levels. This is um, what we have discussed uh, the Coimbra Group uh, public conference this year in June. Uh, in an event uh, organized by our member Charles University. We have um, addressed um, how the European University's sustainability um, um, can be measured uh, at the different um, multi-level governance frameworks, at the international level, the European level, the national level, the local and in some cases regional level, and at the institutional level. What about uh, our recommendations for the impact assessments? Our major uh, recommendation is the coherence with the initial rules of the initiative. There is no one size fits all. So I'm, I'm very much uh, aligned with uh, the recommendation from the previous speaker, speakers. Our main uh, first point is the flexibility. The assessment um, shall, uh, the impact assessment shall recognize the plurality of the alliances. Um, the initial rules of the initiative also included the creativity, a strong uh, creativity dimension. And this um, inevitably leads also to some sorts of complexity and, and the impact uh, this shall be assessed also through the lens of this complexity. A third, um, a uh, key point uh, that was in the initial rule of the initiative is the bottom-up approach. And by fostering a bottom-up approach means that um, each alliance uh, has developed in a very highly context, uh, in a very specific context. So any um, impact assessment should be highly context-specific 
and we need to find the right balance between shared common criteria, uh, which uh, will be requested for the assessment of the initiative as a whole. So we need to find the right balance between shared common criteria and the highly context um, specificity of each alliance. Uh, a fourth uh, point in the initial rule was the inclusiveness. Uh, and here we recommend uh, that the uh, impact assessment also assesses the, 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 the way um, the alliances have succeeded to scale up uh, and, and um, transfer the innovation to the rest of the <clears throat> higher education European sector. And the fifth uh, initial rule was about implementing an ambition uh, with respect to fostering the quality of higher education, research excellence, and societal changes. And these are um, the three lens through which the any impact assessment should be carried out. I have uh, two more um, uh, messages, so some key issues with regards to impact assessment of European universities. The uh, standard um, tension between quantitative and qualitative impact assessments. Uh, the question of sustainability, how um, um, do you assess the sustainability of the alliances? The transformative impact for the sector. We all know that um, the, the alliances are expected to have a structural, systemic and sustainable impact. How do you assess this? Uh, the holistic approach, uh, we are very much... Um, uh, the Coimbra group, uh, we've always been advocating strongly for strong higher education and research synergy integration. And this is for us um, a key uh, aspect in the impact assessment of the alliances, the internationalization dimension, which is also um, something very important to our network, and the uh, impact of the alliances on strengthening interdisciplinarity. And we'll finish with some challenges to the impact assessment of this um, very novel uh, objects that uh, the alliances are. First uh, challenge is the time frame. Uh, first of all, because we know that uh, to have a transformative impact needs time and um, uh, the uh, expected impact of each alliance or of the initiative itself may not be measured, uh, measurable uh, in such a short time frame as the one uh, requested for the, new, uh, for the renewal of the alliances, for the new call for proposal. And second, um, it takes time to assess uh, the, the, the different elements that uh, I've presented. Uh, you need um, time to develop surveys and, and it cannot be done in, in the time frame um, we are talking about. The second challenge is about the funding, um, to, in which way uh, the funding allocated to the alliances uh, can be uh, can challenge um, the expected impact of the alliances. A third uh, challenge uh, is the political changes. We've seen this, for instance, with the Brexit. Uh, what happens when there are political political changes of that scale that can totally um, uh, affect uh, the expected outputs of, uh, of of an alliance when they have, for instance, UK members. Uh, fourth challenge are the institutional changes. In our meeting, uh, at our meeting in June, several of our uh, members involved in alliances were talking about the first generation of university leaders involved in developing the alliance, but how to transmit the challenge of transmitting uh, the enthusiasm and, and the, uh, the political momentum to the next generation of leaders, knowing that rectors uh, would change every four or five years. So the institutional changes can also be challenging to impact assessment. Uh, this one, uh, for instance, uh, the, the unexpected um, changes such as the COVID pandemic and, and how it can affect um, the assessment of uh, impact is initially um, described uh, when launching the project. 
And the last one would be the data, how um, innovation <coughs> Uh, can be um, assessed. This is uh, probably one of the biggest challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, I would like now that we uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, and I'm very delighted to welcome you once again, Annalena Kleiskuli from EUA. You are policy coordinator at EUA and you also participated to all the consultation meetings with the Commission and other stakeholders and alliances. So you know very much also about this initiative. So please, Annalena, I will now uh, uh, share your slides and you can already start uh, if you wish. Yeah, thank you very much, Ludovic, uh, for having me today. Uh, good morning to everyone as well from my side. I'm happy to present you UA's view on the topic, uh, how to assess the impact of European universities. It is actually quite an important topic for us as well as association because we have 215 uh, of our 800 members involved in the pilot phase and there are many more uh, interested and curious in the future rollout, of course, uh, with also getting involved. Um, and I can echo many of the things that have already been said by the previous, uh, by the previous speakers. But um, first of all, I would like to recall as well that it's quite important to consider what Emmanuel just said right before, the timing. Um, it's actually still quite early times to assess the impact of such an ambitious initiative and of the alliances which were just starting a couple of years ago and then hit like we all and like the entire sector by the pandemic. This we should, I think, always bear in mind because building European collaboration and forging such deep transnational relations in a multilateral setting at the various different levels within a university always takes time and may even take more time uh, in, in our current situ pandemic situation still. So, but to answer the question um, about how to assess the impact, again, we've heard uh, we should distinguish different levels and here you can go to my next slide. Um, Olga differentiated uh, many different levels already I would just like to focus on two main levels. Ludovic, you can take the next slide if possible. Thank you. Uh, the impact at individual institutions level, those that are involved in the Alliance, so the members of the Alliance, but also the impact at policy level. And for this, we can again distinguish the European as well as the national and the system level. And I will come back to that a little bit later. I think it's very important to differentiate these levels because the individual alliances and the universities within them should not be made solely responsible for the question whether the scheme, the European University Initiative as such, uh, actually achieves its broader policy goals because this does not only depend on what individual alliances manage to achieve in terms of their goals, but it also depends very much on the external context, on the, some of the challenges uh, we've heard, external things like Brexit, for instance, and, and I will come back to a few other examples a bit later. And it also depends on the fitness for purpose of the scheme itself, of the instrument. And we've heard also uh, already about some of the challenges linked to the, the, um, the funding instrument. At institutional level, the impact should be measured against the goals that each alliance has set out in its strategic plan. So indeed, the appreciative approach that Emily uh, mentioned at the beginning and also uh, um, highlighting that it really needs to take into account um, the differences that the alliance have and their uh, individual goals. So the academic project uh, should be in the focus and that is individual to each of the alliances. Um, and for this analysis, to make this impact assessment, it's also important to look at the reasons why certain goals or certain sub-goals or objectives may not have been achieved yet. So to see to what extent this may be linked indeed to intern, uh, external barriers on which the un universities have little influence on. You can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, a starting point to look at the impact at institutional level is to see also what has changed since the start, what progress has been made. And here we have already heard some of the examples um, from the different alliances that also spoke before. I think in this regard, it's also interesting to recall the expectations that universities had at the beginning of the initiative. In 2020, we've made a survey among our members um, about the benefits they expect from participating in, the, in an alliance and in the European Universities Initiative. And we received at the time 219 answers from institutions across Europe. And the list of expected benefits is quite long. I won't go into all the details, um, but on top of the list is enhancing the quality of learning and teaching, which 75% of respondents considered as very important. And about two thirds also see as very important the increasing attractiveness of their universities for students and staff international visibility, boosting student and staff mobility, strengthening links between research, innovation and education, so the, the different university missions, developing a more strategic approach towards international partnerships, and last but not least, also helping to build Europe and fostering European integration and cohesion. What all of these expected benefits have in common is that they are long-term. And the vision that the alliances had to set out at the beginning of that collaboration also to ob obtain uh, the funding was also long term from the start, even if the funding in the pilot phase is only for three years. So therefore, it is quite hard to measure the impact against these long term goals at that stage. And the same goes for the broader political goals attached to the European Universities Initiative at policy level. What should and I think what can be measured at this stage is the progress made by individual alliances towards their concrete objectives and also the deliverables uh, that they've promised um, at application stage. You can go to the next slide, please. But for a fair assessment, I think what also needs to be taken into account are the external challenges encountered. Here we also asked that already in, in, in our survey, what are the expected challenges? And I think from the discussions we had over uh, the past uh, couple of years, we can see that many of them have materialized and they need to be taken into account. Um, when we asked our members about the challenges last year, many mentioned the need to provide additional funding and resources to develop the alliances and implement the plans. Because, of course, the EU contribution under Erasmus Plus and now also Horizon was never meant to be sufficient. But as we know, the national funding situation of universities across Europe is very, very different. And depending where you go, it is quite challenging in many places. This creates an uneven playing field also among the universities within the alliances sometimes. And having to work in this relatively short-term project logic doesn't make it easier in this regard. So other challenges are, for instance, remaining legal and administrative obstacles. Just one example we have here in the list, uh, challenge, uh, sort of challenges linked to um, legal obstacles in setting up, accrediting or delivering joint programs. These are issues also regarding recognition that are things we know already from the Bologna process for a while and they have been discussed uh, there for a long time and tools have been developed for this. But it would be very important that these tools uh, that are already adopted in, in many cases uh, at the political level, at least they become better implemented across all the countries in Europe. This would ease the things for transnational university collaboration more generally, not only for the universities within the alliances. Um, and this already links as well to the next slide, recommendations, I would say more to the policy level for the future. Um, and they, they are very much linked, I just want to highlight a few here. It shows that additional funding and system reforms are needed to achieve the goals of individual alliances, but also of the initiative as a whole. Um, and therefore, um, <clears throat> this is very much already a message as well uh, to the Commission, but also to member states to actually 
work towards, there was someone talking about, we have to empower the alliances before, and that is very much also uh, in these um, recommendations towards the future. You can go to the next slide, please. So to sum it up, um, here are our key considerations for the impact assessment at the moment. We need to distinguish between the different levels, the individual alliances and their goals and the policy as well as the system level. As said before, the alliances should only be assessed at the moment against what they've promised in their plans and taking into account the external challenges and obstacles that they've little influence on. And the scheme, so the funding instrument, must be assessed against the fitness for purpose. And there I think we can already learn things from the pilot phase, um, especially regarding the challenges posed by the project logic and also uh, the fact that this is not only at odds with a long-term vision, but also the fact that the initiative promotes synergies between the different university missions, education, research, innovation. Um, but this is very much challenged by the different timelines and the logic of the different funding programs used at the moment. Again, time matters. So many, if not most of the expected benefits and overall goals are long-term. Uh, so we can at the moment only look at the progress uh, achieved so far. And last but not least, there is one message to the policy level, to the member states very much. I think if the initiative is supposed to work as a catalyst for reforms, and we have heard also from Minister Vidal about this before, uh, if this initiative has to have a positive impact on the university sector as a whole, on the European education, higher education and research area, then some quick fix solutions are actually no real solutions. So um, it's not enough to say um, we, for instance, uh, in some countries, we see these discussions already having made exceptions uh, in the legal framework for reliances, that is one thing to test an idea, to test things always in uh, mind with a view to make it available to who would be willing to use it and, and to whom it can be useful uh, in the future. But what we need to achieve real impact to use the political op is to use the political opportunity created by this initiative and the enthusiasm among universities to make real system level reforms and to work towards better compatibility of higher education and research system across Europe. And for this, indeed, it would be important to work on the further implementation of the Bologna reforms uh, that would benefit the alliances and universities also more broadly working on transnational collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annalena. This was a very inspiring presentation. Um, I must say, I, I particular, particularly appreciate it. Uh, and I would like also to, of course, thank Emilie, Olga, and Manuel to also have contributed to, to this first uh, insightful session. As you can realize, we are a little bit behind schedule, so maybe we will postpone, let's say, the, the, the dialogue uh, during the debate. Uh, we, we will have sufficient time to, to exchange all together, but just allow me a quick uh, reflection before uh, we will move on to the next session and we will have then the, the, the colleagues from the Commission also expressing uh, other views that, well, basically what we see in your different presentations, and this is also, also the, the, the experience that we are uh, living at uh, EC2U Alliance, is, is basically the main challenge is that we are asked to, at the same time, implement our very ambitious work plan and mission statement while helping reforming the system. And this is indeed a very challenging uh, context, which in a way could be probably uh, uh, said uh, differently, uh, just like if we were uh, flying with a plane that we are actually building at the same time. And indeed, uh, we, we may uh, have the risk to crash uh, while flying, because indeed we are still constructing the plane. So uh, it means that this is really a multi-stakeholder uh, issue that we need to fix uh, on the long term, as you, as you, you said, Nalena in particular. So, so nice, it's my great pleasure to once again welcome 
uh, on, the, on the round table, uh, the, the two uh, representatives from the European Commission. Uh, so thank you so much again, Tine, Tine Delva, you are uh, the deputy head of unit higher education at the Director General for Education at the Commission, and Stein Delore, you are policy officer at the Academic Research and uh, Innovation Unit at the Director General um, uh, Research and Innovation, and you uh, agreed to uh, have a, a duo, uh, so let me upload your uh, shared presentation, and while I'm doing so, do not hesitate to start speaking. Yes, thank you, Ludovic. Um, thank you for this opportunity uh, for me and Stan uh, to, to speak here and, and to listen to you and, and uh, Minister Vidal. Um, because I think what we have, uh, you rightfully said that uh, you have an ambitious work plan uh, already implemented so far and um, there, there is a journey ahead to, to ensure that we can fully uh, roll out the European Universities Initiative, as was mentioned also by uh, Minister Minister Vidal and, and, and other speakers uh, after. Um, because uh, let's be clear that the European Universities Initiative, it, it's a very ambitious uh, long-term vision on, on how uh, your alliances um, uh, should evolve uh, in the future, uh, both on its education and R&I dimension, uh, but also in view of a closer cooperation, in view of the, the governance uh, of, of your uh, alliance. So in that sense, for sure, it is crucial um, to also be able to 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 measure the progress and and to um, to 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 measure also the transformational impact potential uh, of the, the, the initiative uh, as a whole. Um, perhaps you could move to the next slide, uh, Ludovic, thank you. Um, I would also first, before starting, uh, reiterate what uh, Annalena from the, the European University Association already said uh, before, that um, what we need to take into account is that um, the European Universities Initiative is a fairly new initiative. Uh, people tend to forget it because there is so much enthusiasm uh, around it, but even the alliances that were selected in the first round, they are only operational for, for two years, and uh, the alliances under the second call, such as uh, ECTU, uh, you are only operational for, for one year. Given the fact that um, European universities, it's, 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 it's a long-term vision, uh, and it will require many years to fully develop into a fully-fledged uh, European university um, uh, reaching out to, to all the students uh, of your universities and, and to, to all your faculties and to, to all your, your teachers, uh, your academics and, and your, your researchers, we of course need to take this into account also when assessing the progress and this transformational impact potential. We need together with you and, and the member states, uh, we need to um, put forward uh, a, a realistic uh, framework in which we can uh, measure progress, uh, for example, also already building, uh, as mentioned by, um, by Emily from Una Europa, on uh, the, the great work already done uh, from the uh, unique um, project. Um, so what we want to uh, measure is really um, how you bring about the systemic structure and sustainable change in your alliance, how you are really impacting your individual universities and the, the wider higher education sector, both in view of the education components and, and the, the research components, so linking it also to the European education and the, the research area. Uh, so, but what does this... Um, actually mean uh, in practice, we really want to identify the effects of the transnational cooperation on your governance and administration, on your educational policies, uh, on your um, RNI excellence, uh, and also we want to measure the effect on the different actors within your alliance, your students, your academic and ad administrative staff, your, your researchers, your institutional leadership, um, but of course also uh, beyond, we really want to measure the effect um, of, of how you can affect the wider um, 
education spectrum uh, in Europe, both on the institutional level, so meaning the, the also the other higher education institutions not participating in, in alliances, but also at, at the, the national and the, the, the European level. Uh, we would, for example, also like to uh, identify how your work has already inspired now um, uh, changes in the regulatory frameworks uh, at national but also at European level. Uh, we know, for example, that in several member states there have already been legative, legislative changes to accommodate um, for the needs of this closer cooperation. Often these changes are also um, available for, for um, cooperation arrangements beyond the European University. So actually changes to make transnational cooperation easier in, in view of the, the national uh, legislations. Um, and of course, we would also like to um, to, to measure the progress in, in 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 how much, of course, you can also uh, influence your 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 ecosystem, and to uh, to make sure that we can learn uh, from from your lessons learned. We we'll, we also would like to identify some key factors uh, for success, uh, which can um, also uh, help other um, universities. Uh, let me now go to the next slide, and I'll give the floor to, to Stan, my colleague. Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you for gathering this meeting, and thank you to the colleagues from the alliances and the uh, university associations to prepare these uh, clear views and visions. Uh, uh, so this is uh, certainly something that we take into account. Um, I will take some time to explain what we are um, intending to do, what we already started to do, um, and to reply to some of the concerns or challenges that uh, you raised earlier this morning. Uh, of course, the diversity of the alliances should be respected. Uh, the initial ambitions of the alliances should be the starting point of any assessment. Um, we should take the holistic view. That's also why we made the choice to have a duo presentation here. Uh, you can later on assess the impact of this. Uh, um, the importance of synergies is, is crucial. And I listened very carefully to what Minister Fidel said, said that we have to grab the momentum. And, and it's really a, a major momentum that we have now to accelerate uh, support for universities. Now, um, there are three levels of assessment that we are looking at to reply to some of your uh, visions or questions. The project, the alliances, the initiative as a whole, and the sector, which is more like Annalena was saying, uh, policy. These are linked to each other, obviously. Um, monitoring methodology, uh, measuring advancements in the projects, links, influences the rollout of the, the, the future initiative. Um, and at the same time, it tests to monitor progress of university sector, of universities outside the alliances uh, in, in Europe in terms of transformation. Um, the timing may be different for, for the various aspects. Um, so I, I'll explain these levels a bit more. Uh, but listening to, to your visions, I, I think we should also be careful not to be too ambitious, uh, but be realistic. The initiative is accelerating changes and is a catalyst of reforms. We, we can see that happening and we, we build need to know more about it, how far the extent of these changes. But we are not expecting the initiative to do wonders either. Uh, it will take time and especially political will. And the uh, influence of uh, higher level initiatives like the European Education Area and European Research Area on member states reform is crucial here. I will come back to that. Uh, we will come back to that in, in, later on. So let's talk a bit about the individual uh, alliances, the European universities and, and the projects. So there, there will be uh, a study for, for uh, measuring the impact of the project and the initiative at the education level, uh, complementing an, an, a study that just started at the level of research innovation. Um, on, on the research innovation aspects. 
Um, of course, the both uh, project levels are not in sync. Um, the RNI is started later than, than the education, so the evaluation obviously needs to come a bit later as well. But that doesn't um, um, stop us from developing, of course, the uh, mechanism to, to monitor all this. Um, but at the project level, the, the anticipated impact is to, to make progress in, in, in the transformation, in the integrated cooperation. The, both at the individual level, I mean the individual universities, and at the alliances level, the integration of the cooperation. Uh, since your pilots, uh, it is clear that the providing policy feedback on successful models is, is also an anticipated impact. These models will be crucial for the, for the rollout and for the uh, reform of the sector as a whole in, in Europe. Uh, and, and not to forget, you're also uh, first examples of synergies at, for, between programs and between European and, and national level. So you're encountering obstacles um, and, and trying to, to overcome these also at that level. And, and, and policy recommendations in terms of that is, is also an impact that we expect from your initiatives. Now, the anticipated impact of the uh, initiative as a whole is uh, um, the institutional transformation, the modernization of universities. Okay. Um, for, for RNI, it is also uh, the mainstreaming of a culture of excellence while being inclusive. Uh, and, and this is already happening, we can see this. The, the cooperative setting, the integrated cooperation helps accelerating transformation for, for weaker parts of, of participating institutions. Um, so th this is an important uh, impact that, that we want to see confirmed. Um, and of course, as I said, the, the, the piloting of concrete synergies in content at program level, uh, it's important for us to, to take the holistic approach, both in vision and in policy. Um, uh, and for the future initiative, it will be, uh, if we want to be able to move from a project-based system to a more programmatic approach, uh, there will need to be uh, a lot of uh, more uh, efforts uh, being made and, and we hope to see uh, recommendations in that uh, respect as well. Um, now, the third level is the impact of the European Universities Initiative um, on society and I don't think we will be measuring this at the moment. It's not clear if we should do this for the European University Initiative uh, separately. Uh, what, what is important here is to monitor the impact of any transformation process, support mechanism, uh, reform uh, that has impact on society. And I'm talking here about the university sector as a whole. Um, so you're pioneers, um, but as you know, we are developing a European strategy for universities, and, and, and Tina will come back to this in, in one of the later slides. We, we have to be able to measure progress of universities. Um, and so one of the uh, things we are doing is using you as a testbed, I mean the alliances as a testbed for how we can measure this progress. And that's the study for research innovation that is going on. But the purpose of that is not to measure the impact of the individual projects, it's to really to, to have a methodology in place where we can measure impact of support mechanisms on the universities uh, as a whole, and measuring progress in national reforms, investments, uh, how the creation of impact on society of all these uh, reforms. Um, Ludwig, next slide, please, and I give the floor back to Tina. Yes, thank you, Stan. Um, let me continue by uh, by by um, by building also on what Stan said and what some of the, sp the previous speakers said. So, indeed, um, we and, and I mentioned it already briefly before is that we need to have this this uh, realistic framework to measure the progress and, and transformational impact potential. Uh, and 
as mentioned before, it needs to be a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, but moreover, we need to really um, cater for the, the, the differences that there are between the, the European universities. Uh, we, we have now uh, selected uh, 41 uh, alliances, but uh, it is clear that um, they, they have different models. They are very different in how they, they operate. They have uh, different um, they have different di dimensions in, in how they deepen their cooperation in, in education, also uh, linked to, to, to the RNI dimension. Um, others have, of course, also uh, received the, the complementary funding uh, from, from the Horizon program to even further uh, deepen their, their research cooperation. So we need, for sure, uh, to be able to, uh, to develop a, an agile, a flexible system that really uh, allows us to, um, to make sure that our assessment is as tailored as possible uh, to, the, to the alliances at hand, uh, given their, their, their different needs. So in, in, in this sense, uh, what Stan says indeed, it can inspire also um, uh, a further uh, monitoring of, of the, the higher education sector uh, as a whole uh, in Europe. Um, so Ludovic, uh, next to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, let us give uh, you a bit more uh, details about what's going on on the approach, how we are uh, trying to measure all these various levels and the links between them. Uh, we have studies in place, as I said, uh, that uh, the Commission will conduct in close cooperation with the European universities and stakeholders and member states and it will uh, basically uh, prepare a methodology uh, and an uh, indicator framework uh, to, to measure all this, both the projects, the initiative impact as a whole, and then inspire monitoring uh, mechanism observatory to, to measure progress at university level uh, throughout the sector. The study is uh, based on uh, existing indicators, um, and new indicators. The existing indicators uh, usually uh, measure output. Uh, and uh, It was referred to in, by one of uh, the previous speakers on uh, the EU multi-rank, I think it was Olga. We have other indicators. If you take, for instance, um, strengthening of research careers as one of, which was one of the initial objectives of the, uh, the RNI site, uh, there are a lot of indicators available through, through for instance, through the uh, your access, uh, sorry, the HRS for R, the, uh, uh, the participation in, in uh, the label for, for uh, human resources uh, strategy. Uh, you have many universities participate in U multi rank. We have a percentage of uh, mobile researchers that are measured by, by ITER and by, by Eurostat and so on. These are all output indicators and we can measure progress by measuring output. But we, what we cannot measure is the process and um, progress at, at various levels uh, with, with the strategies. So therefore, uh, the, the methodology will uh, have to be a combination of existing indicators and surveys interviews um, and uh, the first generation of uh, European University Alliances is aware of this that we are testing a uh, first set of indicators and uh, the methodology uh, with them. Um, this methodology will have uh, and the indicators used will come back when we uh, review the individual projects against the original objectives, obviously, as well as it will uh, help us um, evaluate the, or assess the impact of the, the um, initiative as a whole. Uh, but mainly it is being, will be used uh, currently to develop a monitoring mechanism for progress of the sector, measure progress of the sector as a whole. Um, the deliverables, uh, will be a methodology uh, and a, an indicator framework 
which will be complemented by, by some, some case uh, studies. Um, yeah, this, this is uh, what I wanted to say. Um, the next Thank slide, you. please. Thank you, Stan, indeed. And then, uh, concretely, some, some examples uh, of elements that we would like to, to, to measure progress on. I think it's very much in line with what uh, the previous speakers uh, have, have already mentioned. Uh, we would like to measure uh, where you are with um, the, the governance elements, um, your, the, the quality of, of your cooperation partnerships, how uh, did the European universities manage to to have this uh, joint long-term strategy and how did you manage to implement it? What kind of structures do you have in place? To what extent are our students uh, and staff uh, in, involved? How, um, and this also links to, to the unique project, of course, how did you manage to put together your, your, your internal and external quality uh, assurance processes? How did you really manage to reach out to, to your entire universities, the, the different faculties, the, the different uh, departments? To what extent are you uh, reaching out to the different educational levels? So not only at master level, but also at, at bachelor and, and doctoral level. Um, how um, uh, are you managing to, um, to proceed with the innovation um, in, in, in education, with, with really focusing on, on, on uh, student-centered learning and teaching, really focused on the learner? How also did you uh, support the, the, the digital uh, transition? Um, how are you managing to, to put in place this into university campus? Um, how do you manage to have the seamless uh, and embedded mobility? How are you sharing uh, your, your different resources? Um, and moreover, how are you um, linking with your, your ecosystems? Can we, can we, um, can we develop uh, meaningful indicators on that that can give an indication of, of how you are uh, strengthening those ties? Um, how are you ensuring that uh, your university is, 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 is more uh, inclusive and how you are contributing to, to lifelong learning? And perhaps then I, I can also pass you on uh, the floor for, for some extra words on, on the, the human capital side, on, on the career side. Stan, I think you are muted. Apologies. Um, what you see here is that we try to integrate the uh, building blocks for transformation of, of research and innovation and, and higher education. Um, and what uh, the alliances uh, took on board uh, at the level of research innovation, uh, uh, many of them took on board uh, transformation areas for research innovation, like the development of a common agenda, which obviously links very much to the mission statement, uh, the challenge-based approach of, of the at the site of, of education, um, the the sharing of infrastructures and capacities. Uh, you decided, many of you decided to to try out. Um, you strengthened cooperation between uh, entities, with entities in your local areas, uh, to to build. Uh, uh, better talent uh, circulation as well as better knowledge circulation and you're you're piloting uh, successful models in all these aspects um, and and this uh, we want to know what are these models so this is part of the assessment that we are doing and um, this will not come from uh, surveys of or output indicators uh, so we are expecting uh, preparation of kind of policy briefs that you feed us with, with more uh, information on, on certain uh, areas, uh, on, on your successful models especially, and the hurdles, uh, the, the not success, uh, no, no, the, the parts where you then could not reach success and what the reasons are, and maybe we can do something about these reasons, uh, find solutions uh, together for it. So, complementing the uh, development of a monitoring methodology uh, through uh, using existing indicators, new indicators, we will need your policy recommendations, uh, which is an important 
output of, of this initiative. Um, so by, by doing this, uh, in, in summary, uh, you're greatly contributing to the, both the European education and, and research areas. I cannot emphasize this uh, because um, I cannot emphasize this enough because you really uh, are the pioneers for what we will develop uh, next year. As of next year, the European strategy for, for universities. And I give the floor back to Tina and Ludovic, if you can move to the next slide and our final slide. Uh, yes, thank you, Stan. I'll, I'll keep it short here. This is just uh, to, to to build on, on what Stan said, that indeed uh, that we, we wish to learn also from, from, from your experiences. So based on, on the indicator framework that, that uh, and the, the monitoring framework that we, we, we will develop together with you on the European Universities Initiative, uh, we really want to see also how potentially this, this could be extended to, to impact the, um, uh, the progress made in, in the, the wider higher education sector. And this links to, to the European strategy for universities that we are currently preparing after a, a consultation process with, uh, with member states, stakeholders, and, and the European Universities Alliances. Um, we, uh, the Commission will most likely um, come forward with the strategy uh, early uh, 2022, so early next year. So, and in there, of course, we, we, we wish to, to build already uh, on, on the experiences from, from your site um, and, and to, to see then also for the steps ahead in, in uh, measuring the, the, the progress in, in the wider higher education sector. Uh, Stan, I leave it uh, to you whether you have some uh, concluding words and um, voila, thank you. Yes, uh, one, only one. Um, while developing this monitoring uh, system, uh, we will of course need to be ensured that it is flexible enough to take into account of new disruptive developments, such as the research assessment reform, for instance, uh, and, and other uh, aspects. Um, that's it. I uh, thank you very much again uh, for your contributions and uh, looking forward to the discussion now. Thank you very much, uh, Tine and Stein, for the, the views uh, that you have uh, actually uh, very much detailed. Uh, uh, and this is, I think, very good to, to hear uh, what are the different views and expectations so that we first uh, uh, can uh, sort of uh, speak the same language. And from that, we can indeed all move forward in the same direction because. Uh, we, we actually very much recognize that, uh, honestly, that the Commission is, is with us on this uh, uh, challenging journey, but uh, there are tensions uh, which are not related to people, but to the systems. Uh, and maybe, uh, well, now we will have the, the, the time uh, to, to, to really have a debate. Um, we have actually uh, people connected on, on YouTube, and there are actually some remarks in the chat. So I will uh, actually raise these, uh, these to you, to the panel here connected uh, uh, on Zoom. Uh, but we also have people uh, here in Salamanca in the room. So at some point, if some of the colleagues here want to uh, raise a question, uh, you will have to raise your hand and the microphone will be uh, given to you so that we can uh, hear you uh, here uh, and, um, uh, loud and clear. Uh, but while you are preparing your questions, let, let me briefly mention something that may set up the, the dialogue also between the, the, the panel members uh, online. Uh, you, you mentioned in particular uh, Tine and Stein, I mean, you recognize that uh, uh, it, it will really take time to set up a very robust uh, alliance. Uh, and we, I think, all recognize it as well. I mean, the presentations from the different alliances and networks really pointed towards this, uh, uh, this, this really important challenge of time. Um, the, the, the main problem, if I may say, uh, is that actually that the alliances are going to be assessed now, which means that we really have uh, this tension between the time it takes to, to really develop the full capacity of our alliances and the very practical aspect of the funding periods that force us to be uh, assessed while we have not yet fully deployed. Uh, 
So how we can, can we reconcile these, this tension? Uh, and of course, probably uh, the member states have a role to play, but uh, this is a question that I want to maybe raise to you and each of you can, can maybe uh, uh, say a few words on that, so I, I will kindly ask you to, to raise your hand with the Zoom system if you can access to it. Uh, and why you think uh, of a possible uh, comment or response, and I saw Emily, you are uh, already uh, prepared to, to intervene. Let me, let me also add one comment uh, that I think is important to mention at this point from the, the people online, uh, the wider audience. Um, one colleague from the Erua Alliance uh, uh, pointed uh, the fact that uh, in the, the, the first session uh, of the different presentations, um, for instance, Olga, you mentioned uh, several uh, existing instruments that are in a way indeed very already formalistic. Uh, while, and we all agreed, and this was in particular you, Emily, who mentioned this, that we need a lot uh, to develop some qualitative criteria. So there is also here a tension, and I think that most presentations pointed out to this, uh, to, 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 to this point, and, and, and allow me just to add one more comment on this, which is we all said that the mission statement of the alliances are central. Uh, they are really the, the, the core uh, component of the, the existence of an alliance. So how can we actually there also assess that there is a great part of very tangible impact but a lot of intangible. So Emily first maybe and then I see Olga is already also uh, asking. So please, please Emily. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to all the speakers. This has been a really interesting uh, discussion so far and um, I'd like to come back to your points um, Ludovic um, it is a challenging situation because we are still in the pilot phase and yet we need to report to be success to show we're successful to get funding for the future. But I think if we remain anchored in our mission statements and in what we want to do, we can draw out some pilot messages of what we've achieved and then continue to set the narrative for the future. Um, I think it's possible, but this really depends on our funders, um, mainly now the European level, but also national funders, to support us in this. Um, I, I'm really grateful that um, DGRTD and EAC are collaborating together to think about the um, quality now and for the future. I think uh, many of the points that you raised, all of them, are extremely relevant to the initiative of a, as a whole. But I would like to have your reassurance that perhaps it's going to be difficult for every alliance to tick every single box. And yet, if we stick to our individual missions, to our individual strengths, we could perhaps each of us cover one, two, three of them extremely well. So then overall, um, the 41 alliances, or however many there will be in the future, will be delivering as a whole. So I have a call for the Commission to be flexible on that, and then an even bigger call have, on how important it will be for us to focus on our ambition. Our ambitions are large, there is a huge amount of dedication around that and hard work, and we don't want to be distracted from a lot of reporting mechanisms. So reporting should help us and not uh, hamper us from doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emily. I do share completely what you just said. Uh, maybe, Olga, you can intervene as well, and then we could let our colleagues from the Commission to maybe further comment, and then we can continue the debate. Olga? Yeah, I completely second Emily's uh, uh, messages that it is really important for alliances to profile themselves and to make use of their strengths. Uh, uh, so completely agree, and this should be also be reflected in the in the evaluation measures. Uh, just to come back to um, the comment online on YouTube about the formalistic uh, approach of the examples I mentioned. Um, well, it's a balance, of course. As I said, I am also very much in favor of qualitative indicators and to look at the mission statement of alliances and to, to focus on this. But we are also talking about measuring impact. So this, this, there is this tension 
in the, 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 the uh, topic of the, of the session and the nature of alliances that they are so uh, uh, different. And that's why, uh, not ECIU University, it was not me, it was a group effort looked into other instruments that are already there that we can maybe cherry pick from. This is not my intention and apologies if, if it has been uh, um, interpreted like that uh, to say that we should uh, copy paste uh, other frameworks because no, uh, the European Universities Initiative is a unique initiative. There's a lot of diversity. We are uh, uh, very ambitious and I also agree with what Emily said that uh, the monitoring, the evaluation should support our development and not distract us from our work. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Maybe uh, Tine and Stein, you want to bring further uh, comments on, on this aspect, this tension, for instance? Yes, Ludovic, if you wish, uh, I can step in. Uh, of course, this, this message is, is well taken, and, and I hope we already mentioned it uh, during the presentation as well, that indeed we are aiming uh, for a flexible approach, because, Emily, of course, we are aware that um, uh, one European University Alliance can cannot, uh, cannot be a champion in, in all the different elements that are put forward uh, as the, the ideal vision of uh, a European university in, in the long term. So we, we do understand that based on your, your mission statements, you may have different focus areas. So, and that, that of course, you, that will also uh, result in, in a different performance uh, on, 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 on several points. And this is where we have always said that we are testing different models. I think this also results from, from the selected European universities. Uh, some of them have similar models, but other couldn't be uh, more, more different than, than some others, and this is, of course, what we would like to see reflected in, in an indicator, in, in, a, in a monitoring framework uh, as well. Uh, and then the point is, is very um, is noted as well uh, to, to try to minimize uh, administrative burden and, and reporting requirements uh, in order for you to also focus on, on, the, on, on the work that, that is ahead of you. Uh, but of course, note of course that um, we, we are providing uh, European funding uh, to your European universities, member states are um, are uh, contributing as well in many instances. So if we want to to develop further, and if we indeed want to go to to more programmatic approaches, of course we need to be able to to show progress and and to to um, to also um, uh, prove that that your universities are, uh, continue to be worthwhile to, to be invested in uh, because of, of the, the innovative and, and the transformational uh, elements that, that you are putting forward. So we need to find the right balance in, in this exercise to, to make sure that uh, with, with a reasonable uh, effort from your side, we, we can demonstrate uh, this transformational uh, aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Tine. Uh, Stein, would you like to add a few remarks? Well, I, of course, confirm what uh, Tina says uh, entirely about the flexibility and also about the, our needs uh, to help you. Um, we need evidence uh, to move to a, a bigger, uh, more programmatic approach. That, that's, that's very clear. But while, when looking for this evidence, uh, together with you, we will, of course, take into account the various different timings and the different models uh, that you are uh, deploying. The timing of the projects in this project-based approach is uh, complex, and we, we need to take that into account. But we need your help. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's key. Thank you, Stein. I see, and Alena, you want to bring uh, uh, another point. Uh, I would like also, while you are uh, unmuting uh, Annalena, to, Annalena to intervene. Uh, I would like to recall uh, to the, the people connected on the YouTube channel that they can raise some comments and questions on the chat, but also here in the room, do not hesitate to raise your hand so I can see you, and then you can raise some questions at some point. Annalena, please. Yeah, thank you, Ludovic. Um, I completely echo what Emily said at the beginning. Uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, that we really have to, to focus on, on the mission statement when evaluating the individual alliance. But I would like to add another point to that. I think this, show, this debate shows 
that it is really challenging to mix these different levels. And it's a little bit unfortunate that we're now having to sort of focus first on what has been delivered already because the alliances are at the end sort of or in, in the middle of the, the pilot phase before discussing whether the instrument or the scheme is actually fit for purpose. I think that even if we have to distinguish these different things, they are of course very much linked. Uh, and I think we have to, when, when discussing and, and getting very much into the details of how to assess the impact and what has been delivered by the alliances, we have to have that other discussion already in mind as well in terms of how fit for purpose is, is the instrument used, because that is something that then will be of importance to discuss with member states and, and policymakers as well. At a later stage, I know that the timeline for that is different, but uh, that is also, I think, very important. I just wanted to raise that again, because it's very tempting to get uh, very much focused on indicators and, and getting it right and so on, but not leaving enough uh, sort of the broader perspective as well of, uh, uh, of all of that. Mm. Uh, I, I must say this is indeed directly connected to my earlier comment on this tension between tangible and intangible. And that's very difficult. We, I mean, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that the Commission is trying also to define these uh, contributions, but that's indeed very, very difficult. Uh, not sure that there is a, a, an existing mechanism to measure this prob uh, uh, easily. And indeed, this is maybe where research, uh, I mean, really a, a field that would study these aspects as a research topic could help. But indeed, again, we are back to this issue of time uh, because of this... Uh, uh, still not yet programmatic approach that leaves, leads us to uh, go from one project to another. But um, yeah, that, that's indeed really good points. Could, could I maybe, unless someone wants to react, but another topic that was addressed this morning um, uh, is actually regarding the global impact. Uh, because what we have uh, in a way discussed so far is very much uh, Europe-centric. But indeed, as in particular Emily, but you all more or less mentioned, there is this also a wish from the Alliance, because this is an, an intrinsic component of their uh, missions. I mean, before being in an Alliance, the individual universities had and still have a very strong cooperation with the outside world uh, through Erasmus program, but through other programs like the, the research program, but also many types of cooperations. So, um, and, and this is maybe a, a question that I could ask to uh, our colleagues from the Commission. Um, uh, do you see uh, in the very near future the possibility to allow the alliances to open to the uh, non-EU but full partners? And, and of course, don't, don't, don't see this question in the sole uh, context of the Brexit, because we know this is a debate that has already happened a lot, but more globally, uh, we know actually that the Erasmus program allows to have uh, uh, very strong cooperation with the international credit mobility, for instance. How could we set up uh, a, a programmatic approach where also non-EU partners could really bring on board, and this would actually also participate to the global impact of the European Union. We know that actually the Commission is setting up, has actually released its global plan, uh, should I say. So does that does, uh, participate to this win-win uh, uh, approach? So do you think that we, we have already the components to include this, or is it still uh, a missing aspect in this initiative? I don't know if Tine uh, and or Stein, you want to comment on this. If I may start, Ludovic, to, to reply to your question. Uh, the, the European universities were, were conceived uh, initially by the heads of state and governments uh, of the European Union as European universities, where universities across Europe uh, who would work together and strengthen their cooperation. And this is, of course, what, what we have done uh, in, in implementing 
in implementing the, the first two call for proposals, both on the education and uh, on the, the RNI side, uh, really focusing on, on universities uh, from, from Europe. Um, what we uh, most likely will be doing is to uh, expand the, the scope, uh, the geographical scope uh, of associated partners to a wider set of countries, uh, to the Bologna countries. Uh, for the moment, uh, because we are still in this initial phase, and as you are saying, it requires further efforts to deepen your cooperation to make sure that your joint educational and research activities can really work out and, and be, be implemented. Because as you mentioned, you are facing quite some, some regulatory issues sometimes to, to implement uh, those joint uh, activities. This is where we, we from, from our side, we, we think that for the moment we, we first need to continue uh, focus this, these joint activities at the, between these European countries to then indeed at a later stage once we, we have uh, uh, solved those hurdles then indeed we can uh, consider uh, based on, on consultations with member states and, and stakeholders to how to proceed but uh, under the next call for proposals uh, we, we do not foresee uh, further expansion towards uh, third countries beyond uh, of course as associated partners, the um, higher education institutions from Bologna countries. Thank you. Thank you, Tine. Stein? Yes, and and could you. I, actually, Stein, sorry to interrupt, uh, but uh, there is maybe one point that where you could bring uh, uh, interesting views, which is the fact that also we have different um, partners accepted between the Erasmus program and the Horizon Europe program, because that in itself also create another tension. And I see my colleagues from the alliances uh, positively nodding and because, I, yeah, this is another more tension. Well, for that, we are in the hands of our political masters, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, let me uh, come back to a um, question or a comment from Anna Lena, and then I'll come back to your question on the international aspect. Um, so, Annalena, the, the fit for purpose of the um, approach we have now, of the instrument, uh, we are indeed, as Ludovic uh, said earlier, trying to build a plane while flying. Uh, but it's, you have also foreseen that. I mean, the alliances have foreseen that. Uh, and you have been asking for uh, bridging funding. Uh, for between now, between the end of the, the project and, and uh, the later phase, uh, when we hopefully can go to a more sustainable approach. Um, so this will exactly give you also more time to, to build further, because we have to face it, we're in the building phase first, and uh, the uh, analysis uh, of the fit for purpose instrument um, will we'll partly come now, but we will have time to, to evaluate further during this, this bridging phase. And, and uh, the fact that we're building now brings me to Ludovic's uh, comment. Um, building now and making the alliance as strong as, as beacons, uh, as lighthouses uh, for the rest of the sector uh, is crucial uh, because uh, in the next phase, the global competitiveness, uh, the improving of attractiveness of, of the um, higher education system and, and the research innovation public system in Europe is, is uh, one of the key factors. And this is what we uh, will also look at uh, when we will be developing the European Excellence Initiative uh, under um, uh, partly uh, uh, supported under uh, Rise in Europe, but which will be one of the actions uh, in the ERA policy agenda, and which will be aligned with the Erasmus uh, European universities. So th at that level, uh, the international competitiveness, the, the cooperation with, with international partners um, will, will, come, uh, will be one of the important features. So. Uh, we will come back to you at that uh, uh, a bit later on that. 
And if I may perhaps also still compliment on, on, on the, 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 this more global dimension, of course we know that uh, cooperation of, of universities uh, with the global partners is key also for, for the competitiveness of, of the higher education sector. So uh, by, by first focusing on, 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 the, on the, um, the European countries, we of course do not want to, to, to neglect that dimension because Ludovic, you, you rightfully mentioned there are currently already other instruments available within both the Erasmus program and the, the Horizon program, which can really help you also to, to develop that, um, that uh, international dimension further. So this is where we also ask you to, based on, on your, your strategy and, and on your, your mission statements, to, to see uh, how to best benefit from the available European funds. Whereas we, of course, for the European universities, currently there is this European-focused mandate, but that doesn't prohibit you to, to use the other funds that are at your disposal at European level and at national level to, to deepen your, your international cooperation as well. And I think in order to, you already had great cooperations with third country partners, but having this alliance um, will, will also help you to further increase your, your international attractiveness and can perhaps even allow you to, to go a step further in that international cooperation. So this is where, where we hope actually that although the funding of the European Universities Initiative cannot be directed to uh, your third country partners, we hope that nevertheless it can help you to, to, to raise your attractiveness and it can, it can help you to build on other instruments, on other funding instruments to, to, to increase and deepen your international cooperation as well. Thank you, Tine. I see, Emily, that you would like to react. Well, could, could I ask you to be extremely brief because we, we are already uh, uh, beyond schedule and I must mention that here mm -hmm. in Salamanca we have a very, very dense program and we need to move now to the City Hall where we will have a brainstorming session with all our associated partners hosted by one of them being the uh, municipality of Salamanca. So uh, please, very quickly, Emily, one comment. and. In the meantime, I would like to ask each speaker to prepare a one sentence to wrap up, but please, maybe Emily. Yeah, I will use this as my one sentence. Uh, to... Thank you very much, Tina. You're absolutely right about the international dimension and how the alliances um, um, help to make Europe's higher education sector more uh, attractive. What we found though is among European um, funding programs today, um, there's not that kind of funding that enables strategic institution to institution collaboration with other partners outside of Europe. And we think that the European Universities Initiative can be a flagship that can uh, show to other parts uh, of the world how we can um, establish long term strategic collaboration, which is also in line with EU policy agendas when it comes to collaboration with Africa. Thank you, Emily. Could you actually make your one sentence wrap up? Oh, that was my one sentence, but if I get one <laughs> sentence more, I'm, I'm happy to say that I think this was a really interesting event. There was a lot of alignment uh, on messages, um, and um, but I think the most important thing is that we on the individual missions of the universities and what they can achieve according to their strengths and allow them really to focus on getting that activity and ambition done and that reporting should enhance that and not come as an additional distraction. Thank you. That was more than one sentence. <laughs> Olga, please. I'd like to add that the holistic approach and synergies between the all missions of European universities are key when measuring the impact. Thank you, Olga. Emmanuel? Uh, thank you. So uh, I would keep that the, the assessment of the impact of the alliances should be shaped as a process to support the alliances and to further um, expand benefits to the whole education sector. Thank you, Emmanuel. Annalena? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say uh, let's keep the academic project of each, each alliance in the focus. Don't add additional policy goals now. It's not the right time. Don't get fixed on quantitative indicators. And with regard to the current timing, because we only had a couple of years, be humble 
with regard to what has been done so far, but stay ambitious for the future. And this counts, I think, for the alliances as much as for policymakers in this regard. Thanks. Thank you, Annalena. And now I give you the final comments and I will then make a very quick wrap up. So, Tine and Stein. Uh, from my side, uh, just looking forward to continue the cooperation with the European universities and the wider higher education sector and the member states uh, to, to ensure that we can help you, uh, the European universities, in uh, realizing your uh, ambitions and helping you in eliminating uh, obstacles that may be on your road. Thank you, Tine. Stein? Yeah, from my side, uh, humble and ambitious uh, from Annalena. I like it. Um, let's do that. Let's have the holistic view, the flexibility, and uh, take into account the huge diversity of uh, the university landscape in Europe. And this is how you're pioneering models that will help us realize the European education area and European research area. Thank you very much for organizing this event. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, basically, we, we have seen that we are all uh, indeed on the flying plane while building th that plane, but we understood that the Commission is willing to take the tools together with us to, 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 to build it while it's flying. So uh, this is uh, uh, indeed something that we need to continue to work on all together. And, and we all know that indeed uh, at the Commission you are very much engaged in this dialogue. And thank, thank you so much for that. So now it's time to uh, close that round table. Um, I would just like to say to my colleagues here that now uh, after the coffee break, we will have to move on to the City Hall where we will have, I think, a very interesting brainstorming session with uh, the, the different associated partners. We, we are uh, hosted by the municipality of Salamanca. That's a proof that we can really build concrete actions with our associated partners. And uh, to the colleagues online, uh, uh, I hope you will continue to follow us today on the USAL Web TV and I would like to thank again all the speakers. Thank you for your uh, interventions and I hope to see you very soon at other meetings. Thank you and have a good day. Bye to all.